Hi everybody, very glad to be here speaking to you guys about it. Um, so I'm here to talk about um, our Airbnb brand evolution which we launched in July of this year. So before I can talk about the brand evolution, I got to introduce a little bit about the history about Airbnb. So who here in the house has ever used Airbnb before? Woo! Yeah. Um, so Airbnb was born in 2008 when uh, originally known as Airbnb and Breakfast. So our founders Joe and Brian, um, they they were they were running out of money and they couldn't pay rent. But there was a big conference in town called the Design Conference and. Um, just like CSS Comp actually and they were thinking what if we hosted a bunch of people and let them stay in our house and you know um, charge them like $50 a night and so they blew up a bunch of air beds and um, hosted some guests there and gave them breakfast and from then on they known as Airbnb and breakfast and over the past six years um, the company has grown a lot um, right now we have 190 um, listings in 190 countries and um, and uh, and we are on track to host over 30 million nights of stays this year. So uh, given that, um, you know, maybe we don't want to be just another um, internet company with a bubbly blue logo. There's a list of some of the internet companies that all have blue logos. And and as we're maturing into a hospitality company, maybe we need to advance beyond the concept of like, we are blue, we are techy, and we are uh, cool or something. Um, so the, the designers last year, they set out to work on a new brand identity. There's a bunch of designers um, hanging out and looking at um, different um, pic pictorial representations of things that are important to our brand, like listings and hosts. And so after they, they came off this cave and they came up with the new brand and presented it to us. So you guys may recognize this. This is our new logo. It's called the Belo, but internally we kind of call it the pretzel because it kind of looks like a pretzel. Um, and then we had a new vibrant color palette, like very youthful, very exciting colors. And the new brand would have a better focus on our community, our guests and our hosts and our listings around the globe. So this came to my, the lab of, of, of my team in January of this year. You know, basically turned the old, old website into like a new website. And so we set out to make it a reality. And if you talk to a designer, they probably have this understanding of what a rebrand is. You know, just change the logo and a few hex codes and you should be done in like a couple of days, right? Okay, well, it's wrong because a rebrand is basically an engineer's worst nightmare. First, you have, a, you have a hardship date, there's no flex. Two, it's a fixed scope, you need to change the whole website. Three, it needs to be top secret. And four, you need to do with legacy code. And not just any legacy code, but legacy CSS, which is not very fun. So then we um, started thinking about how we could ship this project and remain sane at the same time. And this is three of the main principles that we had. First, having a sane CSS architecture so that we wouldn't find ourselves hand changing like um, thousands of lines of CSS. Second, being able to test and measure the progress, making sure that on the launch day, um, everything goes right and I still have a job. And the third is scalable across the site because we have so many um, different products that we need to change. So first thing, talking about sane CSS architecture. Um, just, we want to have an approach to CSS that doesn't drive anyone nuts, which uh, may not be that easy because it's CSS. So exhibit one of typical CSS code. This is actually real code from our site, so I'm not um, exactly the most proud of it. Um, as we heard from uh, Christian earlier today, no, you should not have any ID selectors. And in just these two lines of code, we have over like five ID selectors. So it's very sad. Um, so give, given this state of the CSS, imagine going through thousands of lines of CSS and removing all the rounded corners, text shadows, standardizing the 13 or 14 or, I don't know, 200 shades of gray. Doesn't sound fun, right? And what kind of exacerbated it for us is that Airbnb over the past um, six years has had a tremendous growth, which is great because I have a job, but it's bad because it's hard to focus on quality and we have so many different business challenges that we are 
trying to put out the latest fires and building the latest features, and it's so hard to focus on quality. And so the amount of CSS we had just kept growing and growing and growing. And to me, uh, CSS, the problem with CSS is that at some point, about like let's say a thousand lines of code, you have you you're un past that point, you're unable to like read all the code and figure out what it's doing because um, it's it's so rel it's not rel it's rarely tested. You don't know the effect of your change, and it's just so easy for you to slap on an ID like Christian said to 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 just fix that that visual bug that you have. And so I kind of want to bring in this sentiment from this guy called Michael Federer who wrote a book on dealing with legacy code. And the definition of legacy code is basically any code that's untested. And by that definition, all CSS is legacy code. All right, flip table. Um, because by the def since CSS is, not, is usually not tested, you, you, there's no way to understand the effects of your changes. So in a way, it's kind of true. But that's not the end of the world. There's actually a, a better way to do CSS. And um, this is a quote saying, the easiest way to keep your code maintainable is to write less of it. And that applies for Ruby code or JavaScript code. It also applies for CSS code. So what does it mean to write less CSS code? So we have a concept of um, CSS frameworks that you can write once and reuse so that um, nobody you don't need to reinvent the wheel for every single button in your site. You can write a rule for one button and it just works. And Bootstrap and Foundation are two of the um, CSS frameworks that's right out of the box. And so luckily for Airbnb, even though we had to deal with six thousands of lines of CSS, we were actually working on um, an internal CSS framework that we called O2, which was based upon Bootstrap but cut down for our specific use case. And we had been working on this for um, about a few months, and we had begun rolling it out to be about 10% of the pages by the time the rebrand project started. I kind of want to make a side note about why we called it O2, because it sounds very sciencey. It's kind of a nerdy joke. It's because O2 is the scientific notation for oxygen, and you can't have air, B, and B without oxygen. So, um, so we had this um, framework called O2, and, and on the left is what O2 looked like at the start of the project. And so we had this idea, you know, given our new um, rebrand feeling, rebrand designs, what if we just um, update the skin for O2? And you see on the right is all the same um, elements, but just in a slightly different style. And preserving the same DOM API, like for a button, in the old way, it's called a button primary, and it, it's a blue button. And in, in a rebrand way, it's, it's still called a button, but it, it just has a slightly different color. And this idea is kind of magical, because it, we basically promised like, all the engineers across the site that if you use O2 components, you get an instant rebrand. Because what, what that means is that if you use O2 components, we'll just change the CSS framework out for you, and you don't even need to do anything and get new styles. So this is an example of a page that use um, only O2 components. Uh, and, and when we just change out the, the, the different version of O2, it looks um, completely different. <coughs> and it's a great promise because then you can scale um, the rebrand across the site without having to write that many lines of CSS. And everyone wins. So another um, aspect that I wanted to make sure is um, making sure that we are testable, that we, our progress is testable and measurable. Making sure that we don't have any surprises on launch day. Um, given that we have a hardship day, we want to make sure that on July 17th that everything works and that hopefully I still have a job. So um, what we did was that we, we made this button called um, that allowed people to switch between the um, old version and the rebranded version. And we called it the Brian Chesky button. And by the way, uh, Brian Chesky is our CEO, and he was very excited about it because he was like, now I can go on airbnb.com and you know, just click this button and see what my, um, my baby, my site looks like after the rebrand. But it wasn't just Brian that used it, um, besides, even though Brian really cared a lot about it. What we did was we wrote it out to all Airbnb, Airbnb employees so that designers, engineers, produce, product managers could see the most up-to-date version. And we rolled it out to Airbnb um, employees all across the world in Seoul, in Beijing, in New Delhi. And this was really 
incredibly effective for us because um, anybody in any team could could go to the normal page and just scroll down to the bottom and click um, a button and see and see what it would look like on the day of the launch. Here's an example of our product called Meetups, which is, uh, allows you to um, uh, RSVP to meetups organized around the world. Another example would be our wish list, which is uh, like Pinterest for Airbnb. Just with one click, you can preview what it would look like on the day of the rebrand. And just and um, following up on the, the idea of the different O2 versions, basically the secret sauce is that we would check if the user was an admin and if they had um, they were requesting the rebranded version and just serve up a different O2 package for that. Actually, this is a big simplification because we had to deal with some other technical challenges like caching, making sure that our um, secret rebrand didn't leak. But basically, that was the idea behind it. And this concept of having this single button to test really empowered us to give, get really quick feedback as changes were made to the system. For instance, um, the, what the designers, um, one day they, they wanted to um, change the design of tabs, so what we did was we made a change to O2, we rolled it out to airbnb.com, and then the designer could, could see what it looked like across the site by, by just um, clicking that button. And this quick iteration cycle allowed us to catch some really interesting bugs or some really bad CSS bugs. If you rewrite like a few thousand lines of CSS, you're gonna break something. But if you can't break something, come t talk to me so that I can hire you for Airbnb. Um, so anyway, the, uh, the, the bug that we caught was that um, one day a designer noticed that the red links and alerts look kind of ugly. So they asked, can you make it them white? So typical engineers say it's very easy, I just write some code. So here's a sample code that, that, one might, that you might write to, um, to, make, those, to, to make links within alerts um, white, white and underlined. So I just wanted to take a few moments to look at this and see if you guys can guess what the unintended side effects is. Hint, hint is about uh, element selectors. Um, so basically what happened was that when we had anchor tags in, in buttons, it would overwrite that behavior because it had a bigger specificity than the normal button selector. And therefore, <laughs> buttons all over the site look like this. Can you imagine what would have happened if this had gone out on launch day? I probably wouldn't be here talking to you guys. <laughs> um, so that, that's one, that's, that was a great um, thing about this. It allowed us to iron out a lot of the bugs as we went along. And then the third thing I wanna talk about is um, scaling the rebrand. So for most of you guys who have used Airbnb, you probably think of airbnb.com as a really simple website. Just booking and hosting, like maybe hosts need to um, respond to messages and like you know that's about it how many pages can there be about five right well as I found out through this project um, airbnb.com comprises of booking and hosting and basically like a, t a shit ton of other products and so our approach um, was to um, the promise that we made to engineers was that if you got your pages onto O2 that you get an instant rebrand and this worked really well for a bunch of our different pages. Like um, Meetups, Meetups was, by o 2 find it, um, there was, it just Insta rebrand, landing pages, we got it to O2 and it's Insta rebrand, disaster response, a product that allows hosts to volunteer to host refugees, um, and wish list. And, and that worked really well for us. But I have to say, but, then we come to this, some parts of the system, which is legacy code. So the dashboards, if you guys have ever used a dashboard, the main idea behind it is to consolidate all the key features that a user might want into one place so that they can easily access it. And that's a really good idea in principle. But what, what usually happens in the real world is that more and more features just get chucked into this dashboard and it just gets so complicated. And for Airbnb, what our dashboards looked like was, first we had a dashboard. Then we had all the user settings, things like connecting your Facebook, your Facebook account. And then we had random authentication stuff, like um, connecting your two-factor authentication. And then we had advanced calendar views. 
You guys have probably never seen this, but apparently our hosts care a lot about this because it allows them to see their listing visibility across different properties. Um, editing your profile, um, importing calendars, basically everything under the sun is in, within this single dashboard products. And so when we looked at this product and, and tried to think about what we could do about it, we, we were asking ourselves the question, can we even snap this to O2? So for a lot of the old pages, it was really simple to just convert it over to O2 because it was a single page and it was very simple to adapt, adapt it. But for dashboards, it was a lot more complex because it was a monolithic set of features. We couldn't just change one page because then it would look inconsistent with the others. There was one of CSS everywhere, tons and tons of sprites. Um, and third, it was arcane and crafty code because all the dashboard features were probably written once like three years ago and no one touched it again. So we were thinking about it. So we talk about how can we, how can we rewrite this whole CSS without um, going nuts. And so we thought we needed a more nuanced approach to it. And so we came up with the idea of forking dashboards. So what do I mean by forking? What, I, we, what we did was we created a separate branch of the, the entire dashboard application that um, was using O2, and we, we launched it only to admins. So for every page within um, the dashboard, we would check if the user was allowed to accept, view the O2 version if they were admin, and if that case, um, show them the O2 version, and if not, show them the old shitty version. And this was a really complicated approach compared to just updating it to O2. But it was really necessary because this is just like so complicated and so big that rewriting the CSS is just kind of untenable. And for all the crafty code that, we, that, that nobody really knew about, we, tried, we engaged different teams to work on it. So like for instance, a really complicated calendar page, we will ask the team that dealt with host to look at it because it would just be too scary to touch. And here's an example of us using Asana to talk to the payments team and ask them to help out for us. And so um, over a span of four weeks, we um, forked it, we, we forked it and, and did a first pass over all the different pages. And then we spent another two weeks finding all the bugs, which as you guys probably know, finding bugs is usually a pretty long process. And the third part was basically profit, which is not really a part, but ne never mind. And so um, after we, we had snapped it to O2, and, and, and then so here's what we, it looks like after that. Nice and clean. And we deleted over um, thousands of lines of code after um, merging the fork. So the last thing I want to talk about is, um, uh, is, is is the overall project. What does it mean to be successful as a rebrand? So it's really interesting because like for a lot of um, projects, you can say that the success of our project is with 50% more users, or we have, um, we have um, increased in so-and-so metric. But that's not really how rebrands work. The main purpose of a rebrand is to um, revise an existing brand and make it feel fresh and new. And I think the biggest testament to that would probably be this quote from somebody from a designer actually, saying this is one of the best rollouts that I have seen in a long time. There's a long-term vision for the brand here that will really start to take hold. And like you say, over time, this will be a very recognizable icon on properties all over the globe. And it's especially impactful because as a digital brand, Airbnb.com's presence to the user is, is our website. Our guests and hosts meet each other through our website and they spend lots of time there. And so, and so the, the visual identity of Airbnb is really tied to airbnb.com. And so I, after this whole project, we had 20 engineers working on this, 500 plus pull requests, um, 941 files touched, and over 10,000 lines of CSS deleted. And I think one of the biggest things that biggest things that I liked about this project was the opportunity to get rid of our legacy CSS and bring us into a fresh new world where we can have, we have a, um, a well-encapsulated CSS framework. I used to be really afraid of touching code on dashboards because basically to make any changes, I would need to tr either add an ID selector or troll through th thousands of lines of CSS. And being able to, 
to go to a feature and just start writing CSS and not be afraid of breaking things is such a wonderful and freeing feeling. And um, so we are, and it, in this whole project, we managed to get everything on O2. And for the first time, every page on Airbnb.com is implemented using our own in-house UI and a consistent de design language. Um, and so that's basically all I have for you to share about the rebrand. Um, do you guys have any questions? Hi, my name is Hannes. I have a question. You said you um, build up on the Twitter Bootstrap framework and you picked your own stuff. Um, I don't know how to phrase that. Um, so how do you maintain that? Like you have, uh, you build up on Twitter and if they come up with a new version of Bootstrap, um, do you put that changes in or you maintain your own framework or like how do you move on with that? Um, I guess I, it's not really so much as forked from Twitter Bootstrap as inspired by Twitter Bootstrap because our set of elements is actually quite different than Twitter Bootstrap. Twitter has, Bootstrap has a lot more components than us, so we have basically, ours is like an inspiration rather than a fork. Cool. Hi, uh, thanks for the great talk. I was just wondering, have you had any experience with or uh, have any suggestions for automated CSS testing like you might use on a build server or a continuous integration environment? Oh, it's, um, c a continuous integration solution for CSS? Yeah, like automated, because it seems with the button it's more manual or human-based testing, but something that could be tested by a computer. Yeah, so it's actually a really interesting question because like I used I used to do a lot more Rails engineering and like in that case you can write specs about what that looks like. And unfortunately that doesn't really exist for CSS. There are build tools that allow you to compare screenshots before and after using um, an integration with Capybara, I believe. But we haven't really tried using it. Um, because for us one of the biggest things is just manually testing across the set of browsers we support, which is quite extensive. Um, like including supporting IE8. So, sorry, I can't really recommend a good solution there. If anyone else has any ideas, feel free to chime in. Uh, hello. Uh, what if, I, I see that you change from the old UI to the new brand, to a new brand. And what if uh, when you are changing the, you are redesigning the brand and the, the developer are adding new features, how do you handle this case? I mean, you need to, do something in old UI and then switch to new or something like that? Um, so for the about majority of the um, site, um, we, we simply dropped in a different um, CSS framework. So it was up to the developer to check that um, with the new um, CSS that it looked good. But for dashboards, because we forked it, we actually had to um, tell everyone that you have to um, add your features to both and, um, and design with that in mind, which was which was not easy, but it was the only way to do it. Okay, thank you. All right. Big hands for Fiona. Thank you so much. I think that was great.